Hi everyone, my name is JP and welcome back to the Studio 515 lecture series. This is our first lecture on Spring from the Four Seasons by Antonio Vivaldi. So let's just rattle off some basic info about Spring. Spring was published in 1725 as the first of 12 concertos. Now these concertos were published under this umbrella title, The Contest Between Harmony and Inspiration. But the first four of these 12 is what we now know as the Four Seasons. The instrumentation of these concertos is simple by today's standards. The performing force is solo violin, of course, along with a string orchestra and continuo. Now, listing the source of inspiration might seem like a pretty strange thing to do for something called the Four Seasons, since the inspiration would seem to be, you know, the Four Seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. However, we need to learn about something called programmatic writing to properly understand this. Now, programmatic writing is a kind of composition in which the music bears a descriptive element inspired by extra musical associations like a story or a painting. Programmatic writing of the Baroque era evolved into a significant feature of a 19th century form of instrumental writing which came to be known as program music. So basically, something outside of music is the inspiration for that music. Music is, therefore, depicting something outside of itself, be it art, story, poem. Music doesn't exist in isolation, but has a relationship with other areas of life. So, what's the extra-musical origin of spring? It's believed that Vivaldi composed these sonnets from which he drew inspiration for his Four Seasons. In fact, he wrote portions of these poems right into the score itself. The text for the first movement reads... Spring has arrived, and cheerfully the birds greet her with a festive song, and with the breath of Zephyr the streams flow with sweet murmurs. Lightning and thunder, chosen to herald her, cover the sky with the cloak of black. Then, while they fall silent, the little birds return anew to sing their song. Now, it's a bit strange how the doctrine of affects can fit within this whole programmatic writing thing. On one hand, we know that the doctrine of affects generally results in only one emotion being conveyed at a time, usually throughout a whole movement or composition. But here we have this nice, happy opening, and then suddenly this quick change into lightning and thunder. And then, again, suddenly, things get nice out again. This is definitely more than just one emotion throughout the movement. However, I think the important thing is that we don't have mixed emotions. The sonnet is really conveying happiness followed by fright, ha followed by happiness. They don't overlap, and these emotions are fundamentally separated. Now, if you haven't already done so, please just pause this video quickly, click on the link in the description or on the top right of your screen and listen to the first movement of spring while reading the score. Make sure you keep this link open throughout the rest of the lecture. Now that you've listened to the movement, let's go through some basic but quite important information. The key is E major, which is bright and exciting. There's a lot of energy built up in this key. We're also working in ritornello form, as is common in the first and last movements of a broken concerto, if you recall from our previous lecture, where we have this set refrain that keeps coming back throughout the movement, hardly ever changing, with various responses being interspersed amongst that refrain. Our tempo indication is allegro, which means happy, cheerful, bright. And our time signature is 4-4, four, four, pretty standard. Now we're going to go through some of the key passages of this movement, which the RCM really wants you to pay particular attention to. This is the Ritornello theme. Now stop this lecture and listen to this passage in the recording that you had opened up earlier. The time stamp is marked in the yellow box on the top left of your screen. Great, now spring has arrived and we have these spirited rhythmic figures conveying this bright character. There's this dance-like quality throughout the theme and we start off the piece with the full performing force. This is known as the ripieno. Just for your reference, here's a solid definition of ripieno. Italian for full or complete, this term is used to denote the use of the full orchestra in the Baroque concerto. Now, on our slide we can see that we have solo violin sitting here 
on the top. Then first and second violins, viola, and continuo. Notice on the right side of the page, or I guess closer to the center, uh, that we have figured bass circled in dark red. Now in our second example, I want to draw your attention to how Vivaldi evokes these birds which he describes in his sonnet. Now stop this lecture and listen to this passage again in the recording that you had previously opened. And again, our timestamp is marked in this yellow box on the top left of your screen. This is our first response to the call that the Ritornello theme makes. It's basically a trio between the solo violin, the concertmaster, and the principal second. We have all these high trills seen on the bottom and mordants seen on the top, evoking an image of birds chirping. Actually, I think the recording you're listening to has the sound of actual birds overlaid into it as well, but that's definitely not in the score, but pretty much in keeping with the piece. Anyways, we have all these repeated figures, all this ornamentation, which would be almost cacophonous if the lines weren't so intricately pieced together by the composer. This is our third excerpt. Again, stop the lecture. The timestamp is on the top left. We have this passage evoking a babbling brook. I, I recognize that the translation on the top of this excerpt is slightly different than the one that we're using, which is what the RCM provides, but the spirit is still the same. With the breath of Zephyr, the streams flow with sweet murmurs. This is sort of undulating figure in the violins really captures a sense of calm, quiet, but active movement in the water, this almost hidden energy, all the while remaining extraordinarily peaceful. The lower strings with their steady repeated notes almost hold back this natural desire the upper strings have to push forward, move quicker. You can almost say that keeps the calm, peaceful river from turning into this storming sea. But this quiet world is suddenly interrupted by this quite terrifying force of nature. Which brings us to our fourth excerpt. Please pause the video again and go to where the timestamp indicates. We have this frantic storming passage in which thunder is evoked through the use of tremolo in the violins. Tremolo is the quick repetition of notes that we see directly at rehearsal D where that big blue circle is. We also have these quickly rising 30 second note scale passages which seem like lightning a response to that thunder. And then we come to this arpeggiating passage in the solo part. It sounds like absolute chaos and terror branches and leaves flying everywhere, torrential rain coming down. This bit actually fits the violin extraordinarily well. It's a great example of idiomatic writing. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's easy. It's fairly straightforward, though, and Vivaldi really makes great use of a violinist's natural hand position, the capabilities of the layout of a violin strings. It's a very virtuosic passage and very well showcases the soloist's talent. It's interesting to note that the term concerto comes from concertare, which means to reach agreement. This refers to how the soloist is almost set apart from the rest of the orchestra, the concertino. The soloist is really the center of attention here, and these feats of an individual player's technique are what set concertos apart from other genres, which put the group, not the individual, in the spotlight. And that's it for our lecture on the first movement of Vivaldi's Spring. Our next lesson will deal with the final two movements of the concerto. As always, the slide deck is in the description box, as is the website link to the whole course. See you in the next one.